The Bolsheviks Come to Power by Alexander Rabinowitch. This is Chapter 9, The Question of a New Government. The quick collapse of the Kornilov movement brought to the force the thorny problem of what kind of government should replace the defunct Second Coalition. At the start of the Kornilov emergency, a temporary understanding had been reached between Kerensky, who was bent on creating a strong directory, and leaders of the Soviet, who, although uniformly opposed to the formation of such a government, were for the most were for the moment concerned primarily with shoring up the revolution's defenses. According to the political resolution passed by the All-Russian Executive Committees, the night of August 27th to 28th, um, Kransky was to be given leave to form whatever government he wished, provided only that it remained fully dedicated to leading an all-out fight against Kornilov. On August 28th, when it seemed likely that Krimov's forces would enter the capital and that a bloody clash between the forces of the right and the left would inevitably ensue, it appeared for a time that Kerensky might not act in accordance with the executive committee's resolution. At the height of the crisis, the cadet party leadership sought to forestall civil war by convincing Kerensky to yield his post to an authoritative figure with whom Kornilov would be willing to deal before Krimov's legions reached Petrograd. The candidate selected by the cadets as potentially acceptable to both Kornilov and Kerensky was General Alexeev. On the afternoon of the 28th, uh, Milyakov offered his services to Kerensky as an intermediary between the government and the general staff. Shortly afterward, another high-ranking cadet, Nikolai Kishkin, sounded out Kerensky, specifically on the question of his resignation in favor of Alexeev. That evening, a majority of Kerensky's acting ministers apparently agreed on the advisability of substituting Alexeev for Kerensky, and many of them made their views known to the prime minister. Allied representatives in Russia, led by Britain's George Buchanan, also attempted to persuade Kerensky to negotiate with Kornilov. It is clear that Kerensky, under the weight of such pressure, came very close to yielding his post, but the leadership of the Soviet categorically opposed negotiation. Upon its insistence, Kerensky at the 11th hour rejected the course pushed by the cadets. Of course, by the next day, August 29th, the Kornilov bubble had burst. For Kerensky, there was no longer any question of coming to terms with the generals. One might have expected that at this point, having suffered so badly at the hands of the right and having witnessed the enormous power of the left, the prime minister would have taken pains to retain the support of the latter. Yet, obsessed more than ever by fear of the extreme left and still intent on somehow strengthening the war effort, Kerensky now behaved almost as if the Kornilov affair had not happened. To be sure, he insisted on Kornilov's arrest and on the immediate resignation of Savinkov, and he now proclaimed Russia a republic. But in a charge to the chairman of the commission set up to investigate the Kornilov conspiracy, Kerensky stipulated that the inquiry, as it pertained to the military establishment, should be limited as much as possible to the complicity of the main participants. In addition, Kerensky appointed General Alexeev the cadet candidate for prime minister, to the post of chief of staff. In accepting his new position, Alexeev, whose views on the changes in the army brought about by the revolution coincided with those of Kornilov and Denikin, acknowledged privately that his primary motivation was to ease the fate of Kornilov and his supporters. Most telling of all, as soon as the Kornilov threat subsided, Kransky began laying plans to form an authoritarian government oriented toward law and order. A right socialist liberal coalition cabinet in which the influence of the cadets would be stronger than ever. Meanwhile, the exigencies of the struggle against Kornilov had pulled the moderate socialists leftward into conflict with the government and toward closer alliance with the extreme left. After the July days, most Mensheviks and SRs had actively supported Kerensky, 
in his attempts to disarm workers and suppress the Bolsheviks. During the Kornilov emergency, on the other hand, the Committee for Struggle Against the Counter-Revolution was forced to endorse and facilitate the formation of armed workers' detachments. Although it is difficult to estimate how many workers first obtained arms and became organized for violent po political action at this time, it is safe to say that whatever limited progress had been made earlier in pacifying the Petrograd masses was instantly, uh, was instantly undone. One of the Bolsheviks' most insistent demands as the price of their participation in mutual defense organs, a plea echoed during the crisis by a myriad of mass organizations, was that Bolshevik leaders still in prison on suspicion of having been involved in the July uprising be released without further delay. On August 29th, when a group of soldier Bolsheviks broke out of their place of, of detention in the 2nd District Militia headquarters, evidently with the help of some sympathetic guards, the Committee for Struggle agreed that they should be allowed to remain free in order to participate in the common struggle against the counter-revolution. Pressure to do something about the prisoner issue mounted when leftist officers held in the 1st District Militia headquarters issued a public demand to be allowed to help in the fight against Kornilov and emphasized their demand by proclaiming a hunger strike. Yielding to this pressure, which was strengthened by intervention in the on the prisoner's behalf by the Committee for Struggle, the authorities released a few Bolsheviks at the height of the Kornilov scare. Some other leftist leaders were freed in the first half of September. Thus, on September 4th, prison gates swung open for Antonov, Ovsinko, and Dibango. Trotsky was released the same day, his bail furnished by the Petrograd Soviet of Trade Unions. Several of the Bolshevik officers involved in the hunger strike in the 1st District Militia headquarters, among them military organization leaders Krylenko, uh, Dushkevich, Kudalko, and Ter Arutunians, <laughs> won their freedom a week later. All of these liberated Bolsheviks were to play active roles in the subsequent development of the revolution. Preparing to combat Kornilov, officials of the Committee for Struggle became alarmed that officers in the head headquarters of the Petrograd Military District, supposedly participating in the defense of the city, were surreptitiously trying to aid the general. There were numerous indications that these officers were dragging their feet in mobilizing, arming, and properly provisioning garrison units. Upon their directives, some of the units ultimately dispatched were deployed so as to be sitting ducks for the attacking forces. When the sabotage by the military staff became apparent, the Committee for Struggle sent its own commissars to oversee the staff's operations. On August 28th, when Kerensky had appeared on the verge of stepping down in favor of General Alexeev, the moderate socialists had brought pressure to bear upon Kerensky to prevent such a step. In the aftermath of the Kornilov experience, many prominent Mensheviks and SRs were cool to Kerensky's aim of forming another coalition with the cadets. This was partly because the cadets were now a symbol of anti-republican, anti-reform, and pro-war sentiment, and hence popular opinion in Petrograd was hostile to continued cadet participation in the government. It was also because of genuine concern among the Menshevik and SR leaders themselves about the cadet role in the Kornilov conspiracy. A joint plenary meeting of all the Russian executive committees, primarily to consider the government question, was quickly scheduled for the evening of August 31st, soon after Kerensky's political intentions became known. Meanwhile, a hastily assembled emergency meeting of the Menshevik Central Committee adopted a resolution stating that participation in the government of elements that had sympathized with the counter-revolution, or whose intention had been to paralyze the fight against the counter-revolution, was impermissible. As to the status of the cadets, the resolution declared specifically that they could not longer be included in the provisional government. A meeting of the SR Central Committee adopted, adopted an analogous position. These views were conveyed immediately to Kerensky, who at this juncture temporarily shelved plans to construct another coalition, and instead announced the formation of a caretaker five-man directory from which cadets were excluded. Headed by Kerensky, the directory was made up of Tereshenko, still handling foreign affairs, 
two younger, relatively progressive military officers, officers Admiral Dmitry Verderevsky and General Verkovsky, heading the Naval and War Ministries, respectively, and Alexei Nikitin, an undistinguished right Menshevik who had been Minister of Labor in the Second Coalition, as Minister of Post and Telegraph. In formulating a stance on the government issue, the moderate socialists were faced with a situation reminiscent in many ways of the July days. At that time, massive numbers of workers and soldiers had taken to the streets to protest the policies of the provisional government and to demand that the Soviet assume power. The cry had been, down with the ten minister capitalists, all power to the Soviets. Now, in the first flush of their triumph over Kornilov, the local level mass organizations and the factory workers, soldiers, and sailors who had joined in the anti Kornilov movement expressed their views regarding the nature, makeup, and program of the future government in a torrent of letters, resolutions, and political declarations. These revealed that at bottom, the demands of the masses at this time differed little from what they had been two months earlier. Some representative examples will serve to convey the tenor of these appeals. Workers from the machine shop of the Petrograd Pipe Factory, after discussing the current moment on August 28th, declared, In view of the emerging bourgeois counter-revolutionary movement, as well as the attacks on freedom and on all the democratic gains of the Russian proletariat by former Tsarist police thugs, all power must be transferred to the Soviet of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies. The same day, 8,000 workers in the metalist factory approved a declaration of no confidence in the minister socialists, presumably for their willingness to cooperate with the bourgeoisie. These workers demanded the immediate creation of a forceful revolutionary government. On the 29th, an angry meeting of several thousand workers in the mammoth Putilov factory agreed that the future government has to be composed solely of representatives of the revolutionary classes adding that any negotiations regarding the creation of a coalition government at a time when the bourgeoisie and its representative, Kornilov, are making war on the people will be considered treachery to the cause of freedom. Meanwhile, employees of the Novo Admiral, Admiral Taisky shipbuilding plant, after considering the existing political situation, insisted that state power must not remain in the hands of the counter-revolutionary bourgeoisie a minute longer. It must be put into the hands of the workers, soldiers, and poorer peasantry and be responsible to the Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants' deputies. Public declarations adopted in the wake of the Kornilov affair by virtually all units of the Petrograd garrison were similarly explicit. Thus, at an emergency meeting on August 28, 2,500 soldiers from four key military units based in the capital, the Priobrzezinski, Litovsky, and Volinsky Guards regiments, and the 6th Engineer Battalion, passed a resolution insisting that, gov that the government be drawn exclusively from representatives of the revolutionary classes. On August 31st, the same soldiers, after reasserting the call for a government made up representatives of the workers and poorer peasants, proclaimed bluntly that any coalition will be fought by all loyal sons of the people, just as they fought Kornilov. <clears throat> no less outspoken were the soldiers of the 2nd Machine Gun Regiment, who the same day expressed their views about Kornilov and the immediate tasks of a new government in the following terms. We brand Kornilov and his supporters traitors. We haven't had any confidence in Kornilov since April 21st, when that brave general directed artillery to be rolled out on the palace square to quiet our comrade workers. This, conspir this conspiracy must be crushed with all possible severity, and, w and we machine gunners place ourselves completely at the disposal of the Central Executive Committee. We insist on the immediate arrest and trial of the counter-revolutionary commanding staff and the abolition of capital punishment to become effective after the execution of General Kornilov and his supporters. We demand the restoration of revolutionary regiments that have been broken up and the dissolution of counter-revolutionary shock battalions, the Union of St. George Cavaliers, the Union of Officers of the Army and Navy, the Military League, etc., 
The only way out of the present situation lies in transferring power into the hands of the working people. We demand the immediate liberation of our comrades arrested on July 3rd to 5th and the replacement in prison by the conspirators. For example, Guchkov, Purishkevich, and the counter-revolutionary officers. As regards foreign affairs, we insist on a decisive break with both Russian and allied imperialism and a campaign for peace without annexations and indemnities on the basis of the self-determination of nations. Soldiers' pay should be increased to 20 rubles. The, necessity fund, or the necessary funds should be obtained by confiscating excess profits from plant and factory owners. We will fight for all of these revolutionary measures to the last machine gunner, and the government that carries them out will have our full support. On September 1st, 200 soldiers assigned to the Electrotechnical Officer's School resolved that the replacement of Kornilov with Alexeyev changed nothing, and that the politics of compromise with the bourgeoisie and landowners must and did leave inevitably to the Kornilov conspiracy or lead inevitably to the Kornilov conspiracy. In order to avert another counter-revolutionary attack, these soldiers insisted on the necessity of transferring all power to representatives of the workers, soldiers, and peasants under the control of their elected organizations. A mass meeting of soldiers from the Petrogradsky Guards Regiment two days later called for the creation of a new cabinet made up exclusively of socialists, who have suffered in prisons for the people's cause and who have wasted the best years of their lives in far off Siberia. Like the second machine gun regiment, the soldiers from the Electro Technical School and the Petrogradsky Guards Regiment also demanded death for Kornilov and his followers. Not surprisingly, bitterness toward Kerensky and the desire for an immediate change in government after the Kornilov experience were nowhere stronger than among the radicalized Baltic sailors. On August 30th, the crew of the Petropolovsk, who had voted earlier to execute officers refusing to pledge loyalty to the revolution, agreed that death is the most appropriate punishment for Kornilov. The resolution they adopted asserted that only the democracy in the person of its finest representatives, the executive committees of the Soviets of workers, soldiers, and peasants deputies, can save the country. Consequently, all power must be transferred into the hands of the Soviets. Experience has shown, the resolution continued, that coalitions of responsible ministries of any kind are incapable of leading the country out of the critical situation in which it finds itself. It is the direct responsibility of the Soviet to take power into its hands, and we will gladly submit to such a government and obey all its orders with pleasure. Distinctly more critical of the moderate socialists was a resolution on the current moment adopted overwhelmingly at a point at a joint meeting of the Helsingfors Soviet, the regional executive committee of the army, fleet and workers in Finland, and representatives of army and ship committees from the Helsingfors area on September 2nd. Concluded the resolution. Up to now, not only has the Central Executive Committee neglected to pursue a policy of furthering the revolution by supporting the politics of compromise with the bourgeoisie, it has strengthened the position of the counter-revolution. This kind of behavior must cease. We emphatically insist that the Central Executive Committee refrain from pledging confidence to any coalition ministry with the bourgeoisie and that it immediately convene the Second All-Russian Congress of Workers, Soldiers and Peasants Deputies i.e. to create a Soviet regime. To register their protest against Kerensky's proclamation of a non-democratic republic while forming a directory and conducting negotiations with the bourgeoisie, members of 19 Baltic fleet ships committees meeting jointly on September 6th recommended that ships of the fleet fly red, red battle flags until the promulgation of all reforms associated with a democratic form of government. And Centrobalt endorsed this method of protest the following day, after which the red flags were raised. The mood of the Baltic sailors at this time was also expressed in a lead editorial entitled Enough of Past Errors by, B, by V. Maslenikov 
in Izvestia Kronstadtskogo, Soveta. On August 29th, the Kronstadt Soviet adopted a set of demands to be presented in the Central Executive Committee by Kronstadt's representative there. Drawn up by the Bolsheviks and immediately endorsed by the SR and Menshevik internationalists, the main SR and Menshevik factions in Kronstadt, these demands were patterned after the moderate resolution on the current moment, which Lunikarsky had introduced at the Executive Committee's meeting the night of August 27th to 28th, and which had called for a decisive rupture with the capitalists. The transfer of power into the hands of revolutionary workers, peasants, and soldiers, and the creation of a democratic republic. Kronstadt's ideal remained a democratic Soviet government in which all socialist groups would work together effectively in pursuit of a revolutionary program, precisely as the socialists had been doing locally in the Kronstadt Soviet since March. The Kronstadt sailors were heartened by the prospect that the Kornilov experience might serve to bring the moderate socialist leadership of the all-Russian executive committees back into the revolutionary fold. This hopeful attitude was expressed by deputies to the Kronstadt Soviet in their response to a report on the latest developments in Petrograd presented to them by Kolbin on August 29th. After lashing out at Kerensky for indecisiveness in combating Kornilov, Kolbin, in the course of his account, related that when Tsuritelli had declared to the Central Executive Committee that this was a time not for compromise, but for strong military action, Chernov had embraced him in a gesture of solidarity. The Kronstadt deputies greeted with stormy applause this sign of moderate socialist unity in defense of the revolution. It is worth noting that even workers in industrial plants that heretofore had been Menshevik and SR strongholds, as well as soldiers in some of the more politically restrained regiments of the garrison, for example, those which initially had remained neutral and subsequently had taken the lead in helping to suppress the July uprising, now turned against the government. What is more, even some of the military personnel rushed from the front to the capital after the July days, now join the ranks of the opposition. The political resolutions passed at this time were inspired by no single party or organization. Some were proposed by Bolsheviks, others by Menshevik internationalists or left SRs, and still others by individual or representative individuals or representatives of interest groups with no identifiable political affiliation. These statements varied greatly in regard to specifics. Some called for the creation of a government representing workers, soldiers, and peasants. Others, perhaps a majority, insisted on transfer of power to the Soviets or creation of a revolutionary government responsible to the Soviet, often coupling such demands with a call for another National Congress of Soviets. However, common to virtually all were concerned or were concerned that Kornilov and his supporters be dealt with harshly so as to avoid further attacks by the counter-revolution. Aversion to political collaboration with the property classes in any form and attraction for the immediate creation of some kind of exclusively socialist government which would bring an end to the war. It is evident that to many, including Bolsheviks, the swift defeat of Kornilov appeared to confirm the immense potentialities of all socialist groups working together. Such a large representative number of statements are available for study, either in the contemporary press or in public document collections, and they are corroborated so strongly by other kinds of evidence that it is fair to conclude that among Petrograd workers and soldiers, and Baltic sailors who express themselves politically in any way, 
these sentiments were by now nearly universally shared. Such were the pressures under which members of the All-Russian Executive Committees labored as they assembled to consider the government question late on the afternoon of August 31st. This session, which with adjournments lasted until the early morning of September 2nd, merits consideration as one of the most important meetings of the Soviet leadership between February and October 1917. Prior to the October days, at any rate, this seems to have been the moment when the Mensheviks and SRs came closest to breaking with the Liberals and adopting much more radical policies, which might significantly have altered the revolution's course. Early in the discussion, Kamenev proposed that the deputies adopt a broad policy statement on the government question, which, while relatively moderate in content and tone, nonetheless constituted a fundamental decisive break with previous Soviet policy. Kamenev himself had composed the statement and it had been endorsed at an early, earlier caucus of Bolshevik Central Committee members with representatives of the Bolshevik fractions in the All-Russian Executive Committees and the Petrograd Soviet. It began with a forthright repudiation of the politics of compromise and irresponsibility, which made it possible for the military high command and the institutions of government to become breeding grounds for the instrument of a conspiracy against the revolution. The statement called for the exclusion from the government of the cadets and all representatives of propertied elements, and affirmed that the only viable course open to the democracy was to create a national government made up of representatives of the revolutionary proletariat and peasantry, whose first task would be to proclaim a democratic republic. Republic. <clears throat> Other basic tasks of this new government would be confiscation of manorial lands without compensation and their transfer to peasant, com peasant committees in advance of the, co of the constituent assembly. Proclamation of workers' control over industrial production, nationalization of key branches of industry and the proposal of universal democratic peace. Among measures for immediate implementation, the resolution called for an end to all repression directed against the working class and its organizations, abolition of capital punishment at the front and restoration of full freedom for political agitation and activity on the part of democratic organizations in the army, a purge of the counter-revolutionary commanding staff within the military, recognition of the right to self-government of minority nationalities living in Russia, immediate convocation of the constituent assembly, and abolition of all class privileges. Um, how did I lose my place? Okay. The resolution's emphasis on the formation of a revolutionary government to create a democratic republic rather than a dictatorship of the proletariat and poorer peasantry was obviously Kamenev's work and represented an accurate reflection of programmatic views regarding the development of the revolution consistently held by Bolshevik moderates. At the same time, Kamenev's statement was a succinct and powerful formulation of the political aspirations of Petrograd workers and soldiers, as expressed in the wake of the Kornilov experience. In presenting the resolution to the executive committees, Kamenev appealed for the maintenance of the Unified Revolutionary Front, which had emerged in the course of the struggle against Kornilov, placing particular emphasis on the crucial role of the Soviets, which had served as the mortar binding all fundamentally democratic forces during the crisis, he contended that no one can say that there exists at the present time any organization more powerful than the Soviets. It is extremely important to note that while the policy statement proposed by Kamenev was universally interpreted as an appeal for transfer of political power to the Soviets, Kamenev himself did not insist on this. Evidently, envisioning the possibility of a socialist cabinet which would include representatives of such democratic institutions as the trade unions, uh, Zemstvos, municipal dumas, and cooperatives, which are not nominally part of the Soviet. As he observed toward the close of his remarks, the Bolshevik fraction is concerned not with purely technical aspects of forming a, a government, but rather with the elements to be included in such a government. Are they of like mind in their understanding of the immediate tasks and will they be able to march in step with the democracy?
Because of a conflict with a provisionally scheduled session of the Petrograd Soviet, the Executive Committee's meeting was adjourned at 7.30 p.m. without having voted on the Kamenev Resolution. Further discussion of the government's the government question was tabled until the following evening. Kamenev's resolution was next presented at the late night meeting of the Petrograd Soviet on August 31st, the first meeting of that body in 10 days. Political attitudes in the Petrograd Soviet had been shifting leftward throughout the month of August. This was a reflection both of the growing misgivings on the part of incumbent deputies regarding the existing political situation and of the changing composition of the Soviet, as moderately inclined deputies elected in March and April were, were recalled and replaced by factory and garrison representatives with more militant views. This transformation was immediately apparent on August 31st. The agenda opened with reports on the latest political developments. Boris Bogdanov, a uh, Menshevik, brought the deputies up to date on the work of the Committee for Struggle Against the Counter-Revolution. Responding to the anger and impatience of his listeners, Bogdanov focused on the Committee's efforts to strengthen and unite the left and to prevent the government from coming to terms with Kornilov. At each indication of forcefulness on the Committee's part, both in counteracting Kornilov and in dealing with Kerensky, the deputies burst into applause. On the question of a new government, Suratelli publicly acknowledged for the first time the difficulty of including cadets in the cabinet. However, he defended in the strongest terms coalition with representatives of other bourgeois groups. The democracy by itself would be helpless to deal with economic disintegration, he argued, and this situation will play into the hands of the counter-revolution. Suratelli's remarks were frequently interrupted by vociferous protests. and jeers which prompted the chairman, uh, Chkaidze, finally to blurt, the Soviet still has enough power to throw disruptors out the door. Kamenev, by contrast, was spiritedly cheered when he presented his policy statement and repeated the attack on coalition politics that he had made earlier to the executive committees. Steklov also brought the deputies to their feet when he expressed solidarity with Kamenev. The SR spokesman, uh, Bolderev, broke with a previous moderate socialist policy by proposing that the executive committees construct a new cabinet. Bolderev introduced a resolution which provided that such a government might include representatives of some bourgeois groups, although not the cadets, and that it would be responsible to a provisional revolutionary parliament, but even this compromise was coolly received. <clears throat> uh, lost my place. After several hours of further heated debate on the pros and cons of creating an exclusively socialist government, at about 5 a.m. September 1st, the deputies rejected the resolution of the SRs and adopted as a political platform the statement offered by Kamenev. The vote on the, on the Kamenev proposal was 279 deputies in favor, 115 opposed, with 51 abstentions. In assessing the significance of this Bolshevik success, it is important to note that the number of deputies present and voting on this occasion constituted a, rel a relatively small fraction of the Petrograd Soviet's total membership. This was at least partly because many military representatives were still on duty with their regiments, defending the capital against Kornilov. It is also true that many rank-and-file left Mensheviks and SRs with no organizational loyalty to the Bolsheviks sided with the Bolsheviks on this issue. Nonetheless, as suggested earlier, the vote of, of the Petrograd Soviet on August 31st reflected a gradual, although by no means negligible, leftward shift in the deputies' orientation. It is worth recalling in this connection that on March 2nd, a Bolshevik resolution opposing assumption of power by the provisional government received a mere 19 votes in the Petrograd Soviet while the resolution sponsored jointly by the Mensheviks and SRs pledging qualified support for the government attracted 400 votes. On April 2nd, when membership in the Petrograd Soviet more nearly approximated its full strength, a Bolshevik resolution opposing endorsement of the Liberty Loan Drive 
and effect a referendum on the war received 112 votes, while the Menshevik SR resolution supported the, dr the drive received 2,000 votes. In the wake of the April crisis, a month later when the deputies had to adopt a position on socialist participation in the cabinet, 100 deputies voted for a Bolshevik resolution, which opposed participation, while Menshevik SR strength held firm at 2,000. Popular support for the Bolshevik program rose on the eve of the July days, and this was reflected to a limited extent in the Petrograd Soviet. Thus, on June 20th, a moderate socialist resolution endorsing the Kerensky offensive received 271 negative votes with 39 abstentions. But the August 31st session marked the first occasion on which a clear majority of the deputies present voted with the Bolsheviks on any political issue. Adoption of the Kamenev Resolution, which embodied a fundamental reorientation of priorities and goals, necessitated reorganization of the entire Petrograd Soviet leadership, a factor of immense subsequent importance to the development of the revolution. In the short run, however, and as much as the direct authority of the Petrograd Soviet was limited to the capital, the still uncertain decision of the all-Russian executive committees on the government question was naturally a far of more far-reaching significance. Responsibility for the immediate fate of the government was in their hands. The all-Russian executive committees resumed their discussion of the government question late on the evening of September 1st, at about the time Kerensky announced the creation of a directory. Yet, despite the popular desire for a reorientation of Soviet politics, which passage of the Bolshevik resolution in the Petrograd Soviet represented, and the fact that Kerensky, in, in announcing the formation of the directory, had presented the executive committees with a fait accompli. The continuing reluctance of the moderate socialists to break altogether with the existing re regime was established from the outset. A procession of leading Mensheviks and SRs, among them Skobolev and Bogdanov, spoke against the Bolshevik position and urged that the existing government be supported at least until the Democratic State Conference. The right Menshevik, Mark Liber, ridiculed the very notion that the democracy could go it alone, declaring, The cadets have been thrown from the chariot, but let us take heed, lest we end up in it by ourselves. Av... Av... Oh, fuck. Av... Kizentiev? Sure. Actually hailed the directory and asked that it be supported in every way possible. Chernov declared emphatically that no SR would join a government which included cadets. He did not, however, dismiss the possibility of forming a coalition with representatives of other bourgeois circles. Sergei Znamensky, on behalf of the Trudoviks, also defended the principle of coalition, insisting we should not create a purely socialist ministry. There are social and political groups, apart from the cadets, that can walk arm in arm with us. Besides the Bolsheviks, only, Morto only Martov adopted a significantly more radical stance. He espoused the creation of an all-socialist ministry responsible to a democratic parliament. Ryazanov and Kamenev attempted to rebut the moderate socialists with reference to a comment made earlier by Skobolev. Ryazanov remarked, It has been argued that there... It has been argued there that the mood in Petrograd is not representative of the rest of Russia, but people in the provinces watch what is going on in Petrograd closely. And when we tighten the noose around the neck of the counter-revolution, there is no doubt we will find broad support among them. If one rejects coalition with the cadets, we are left with the commercial, industrial, and banking circles, which, as is now evident, nourished the yellow press. It is high time to take into consideration the fact that the Soviets represent the majority of the Russian people. Let the Soviets select a provisional government responsible to them, which would lead the country to a quick convocation of the Constituent Assembly. Only the Constituent Assembly can conclude peace, enact necessary reforms, and bring us closer to socialist restructuring of society. For his part, Kamenev, referring to the announcement of a directory, complained acidly that the executive committees have been hit with another blow from Kerensky. Their significance has been reduced to nothing. I would hope, he continued, that you will repel this blow as you repelled Kornilov's attack. 
Political duty demands that we declare that this government is not intended to serve the needs of the democracy, but of Kerensky. We see in what has occurred the consequences of a regime based on personal dictatorship and total irresponsibility. The proletariat, peasantry, and army must state that there is no place for this in the Russian Revolution. Tsiritelli attempted to counter these arguments with the comment that we are convening a broad democratic conference. And if it turns out that apart from us, there are no other vital elements in the country, we will take power into our own hands. This was as close as Tsiritelli and his supporters were to come toward acknowledging the possibility of forming an exclusively socialist government. In the early morning hours of September 2nd, the exhausted deputies voted upon and rejected the declarations of both the Bolsheviks and Menshevik internationalists, and adopted instead a resolution sponsored jointly by the Mensheviks and SRs. The approved resolution endorsed the early convocation of a democratic state conference to arrive at a final decision on the government question, and in the meantime, called for continued support of the existing regime as formed by Kerensky. Although in retrospect, the executive committee's decision to go along temporarily with the direct directory appears to have been a particularly fateful step. It would obviously have been a very diff it sorry, it would obviously have been very difficult for the moderate socialists to have acted otherwise. Support for the course proposed by the Bolsheviks would have required the Mensheviks and SRs to repudiate their policies of the preceding six months and abandon their ideal of creating a democratic government representing all classes. It would have signified willingness on their part to form a new political regime and to take full responsibility for maintaining civil order, administering the economy, providing essential food and fuel supplies and services, and satisfying mounting mass demands for immediate social reform and peace. Further, adoption of the Bolshevik Resolution would have indicated the moderate socialists' readiness to attempt these tasks without the help of, indeed faced with certain opposition from, liberal political leaders, industrialists, and large landowners, as well as the military command. Finally, for the Mensheviks and SRs to have united with the Bolsheviks as Kemenev and Ryaz Ryazanov eloquently advocated, would have meant forming an alliance with elements of dubious reliability whose political goals were often less compatible with their own than were those of the liberal bourgeoisie. If one takes into consideration um, the Bolsheviks' past behavior, coupled with the German military threat and the prevailing economic and social chaos, it is perhaps not so difficult to understand why the main body of Mensheviks and SRs, despite their by now almost universal disdain for Kerensky, resisted popular pressures for an immediate change in government. The political effects of the Kornilov experience were enormous. For the time being, the rightist movement was, of course, shattered. Kornilov, the darling of the right, was under house arrest in Moglev. Because of their behavior, both before and during the crisis, the cadets were widely suspected, to some extent unfairly, of having been in league with Kornilov. In the aftermath of the affair, they were temporarily excluded from the cabinet, much maligned and deeply demoralized. Milyakov and Kukoshkin departed for the Crimea, as if fleeing arrest. Maklakov became ambassador to France, and numerous other cadets retreated to their summer homes in the country. Cadet politics virtually ground to a halt, or to a half, sorry. Because of internal disputes in regard to the nature and makeup of the future government, the Mensheviks and SRs were scarcely in better shape. Fundamental differences of opinion on the key political issues of the day among leading Mensheviks emerged with particular clarity at a meeting of the Bureau of the Central Executive Committee on September 4th. In the course of an acrimonious debate on the goals of the Democratic State Conference, Scheduled to open in mid-September, uh, mid the defensist Bogdanov joined the Menshevik internationalists Martov and Sukhanov in arguing the case for the formation of an exclusively democratic regime. The coming conference must be turned into a constituent assembly for the democracy, insisted Bogdanov, and the government formed there, made responsible to the conference. Such ideas seemed preposterous to Chikhaidze, 
the Central Executive Committee chairman. Along with Liber, he underscored the importance of including at least some representatives of propertied elements in any future government, as well as at the Democratic State Conference. Dan and Siratelli took a middle position between the Bogdanov and Chikaidze, oh, I'm definitely pronouncing that wrong, factions, acknowledging that the primary purpose of the conference was to arrive at a definitive solution to the government question and expressing readiness to abide by the conference's decision on the matter, whatever it might be. Siratelli, who personally preferred a coalition, voiced regret that an assembly of all the democratic groups to be represented at the conference had not been conve convened earlier adding that if the vote is for a Soviet regime, then we can take risk, then we can risk it. <sighs> Similar arguments were also tearing the SRs apart at this time. Thus, while a still influential conservative SR faction headed by Afghan Steve insisted on the necessity of preserving a broadly representative coalition government, including cadets, the former minister of agriculture, Chernov, wanted nothing more to do with the cadets, Yet Chernov was equally opposed to the idea of an exclusively socialist government, sharing with many right Mensheviks the hope of attracting into the cadet, into the cabinet representatives of the bourgeoisie, accepting the cadets who would be willing to cooperate with socialists in realizing a meaningful reform program. Meanwhile, well to the left of Chernov was an increasingly vocal and powerful left SR faction now almost an independent party, which adamantly rejected any kind of coalition with the bourgeoisie. During the second week in September, the left SRs gained control of the local SR committee in Petrograd. Simultaneously, they launched a campaign for the convocation of a National Congress of Soviets and the creation of a homogeneous socialist government responsible to the democracy. The SR organization, to use Oliver Radke's words, had entered the final stage of disintegration. Not surprisingly, the Kornilov affair also made a shambles of whatever modest success Kerensky had achieved since early July in restoring governmental authority and strengthening the army. The Soviets, now distinctly more radical in outlook, emerged from the crisis with their popularity among the masses immeasurably enhanced. Revolutionary Russia was more widely saturated than ever before with competing grassroots political organizations and revolutionary committees. Workers had become more militant and better organized, and significant numbers of them had obtained weapons. At the same time, democratic committees in the army, by virtue of their leading role in organizing soldiers against the Kornilov movement, were rejuvenated, with the Petrograd garrison control of many of the Bolsheviks. Oh, sorry. Within the Petrograd garrison, control of many regimental committees passed from more moderate elements into the hands of the Bolsheviks. Whatever moral authority officers still possessed among the troops was badly damaged by the Kornilov experience. During the first half of September, a second purge of officers suspected of harboring counter-revolutionary sentiments was carried out in many units, and in the meantime, the execution of even the simplest orders became very difficult. The government endeavored to reverse these developments. On September 1st, for instance, Kerensky issued a directive to all military commanders, commissars, and army organizations to put a halt to political activity among the troops. But the order seems to have had no discernible impact. Three days later, Kerensky published a decree dissolving all ad hoc revolutionary committees established during the Kornilov crisis, which included the Committee for Struggle Against the Counter-Revolution. The decree served merely to exacerbate relations between Kerensky and the Soviet leadership. No sooner had the order become public than the Committee for Struggle went into session, this in itself an act of civil disobedience, and adopted a carefully worded resolution expressing confidence that, in view of this still threatening situation, all local revolutionary committees would continue to operate with their previous energy and restraint. While the government strived in vain to cope with these difficulties, the disintegration of the economy continued apace. In Petrograd, the problems of unemployment, food and fuel shortages, and inflation now became significantly more acute. During these days as well, Kerensky's personal re reputation was virtually destroyed. To the defeated right, it appeared that because of either personal ambition or lack of courage, Kerensky had betrayed Kornilov. Meanwhile, to the left and to the masses of Petrograd workers and soldiers, 
it appeared that Kerensky was part and parcel of the counter-revolution. In a valuable unpublished memoir, Wojtynski, then commissar of the Northern Front, focused attention on this factor, recalling that every soldier knew that the conflict between Kerensky and Kornilov had been preceded by negotiations between them, and that discussed in and that discussed in these negotiations were the imposition of capital punishment, the curbing of soldiers' committees, the return of power to officers, in short, a return to the ways of the old regime. Consequently, to the average soldier, the Kornilovshina appeared as a conspiracy against himself and against the revolution on the part of the military high command and Kerensky. Among the competitors for power in 1917, then, it is clear that the winners in the Kornilov affair were the Bolsheviks. The defeat of Kornilov testified to the great potential power of the left and demonstrated once again the enormous attraction of the Bolshevik program. Yet it seems questionable to argue, as some do, that Kornilov's defeat made Lenin's victory inevitable. The mass mood was not specifically Bolshevik in the sense of reflecting a desire for a Bolshevik government. As the flood of post-Kornilov political resolutions revealed, Petrograd soldiers, sailors, and workers were attracted more than ever by the goal of creating a Soviet government uniting all socialist elements. And in their eyes, the Bolsheviks stood for Soviet power, for Soviet democracy. In any case, the July uprising and the subsequent reaction had demonstrated the risks inherent in relying on the mood of the masses. Moreover, the entire history of the party from the February Revolution on suggested, or from the February Revolution on, suggested the potential for programmatic discord and disorganized activity existing within the Bolshevik ranks. So that whether the party would somehow find the strength of will, organizational discipline, and sensitivity to the complexities of the fluid and possibly explosive prevailing situation requisite for it to take power was at this point still very much an open question. <laughs>